and I just want to start by actually um, thanking, in right now, first thanking CIFAR and thanking NIH. Um, and in being invited to this uh, talk this afternoon, I was just reflecting on how important CIFAR has been for my career. It's almost an understatement um, to say that the UCSF CIFAR was instrumental to my career because my first grant was a CIFAR grant. And it was uh, when I was a postdoc at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies 10 years ago. Um, so that very first uh, CIFAR grant was a study to examine qualitatively the HIV risks uh, faced by female migrants in Western Kenya. That study helped to uh, provide the preliminary data for the K01 study that I then uh, uh, succeeded in having funded from, from NIH, NI, NIMH. Um, which also permitted me to have a faculty position here at UCSF. And then while assistant professor, I, I um, was awarded a second CIFAR grant, which was a study to develop new methods for um, sampling uh, female migrants who are engaged in informal sector trading, so um, market traders. So we, we did a, um, a prevalence survey in Kibuya Market, which is the third largest open air market in Western Kenya. And Paul and Warner visited Kibuya Market and they got to see how people there will make anything out of anything and sell it, like take car parts and create cooking pots and pangos and um, so they got to see where we conducted that work, which was, which was great. Um, so I just want to um, highlight that uh, the, the CIFAR support for postdocs um, doesn't necessarily, uh, is not, not necessarily there in all the CIFARs, and it has been here at UCSF, and that's been very, very important for so many of us. Um, and the other thing I want to just uh, highlight is that CIFAR funding for social science research has been very, very important, and it's um, the lifeblood for so many of us who are, are very happy to be engaged and work um, in partnership with our clinician colleagues here in the context of a medical school. Um, but that, that support of, of, you know, not just the basic, basic sciences and translational and clinical uh, work. Um, but also uh, social sciences has been really, really important. So thank you all so much. So I'm going to present today some very brand new data, hot off the presses, from this uh, manuscript that we just yesterday was published in Health in Place. Um, so I haven't presented these data before, um, but we're um, presenting information on uh, the forms of mobility uh, associated with HIV across three different epidemics with very unique epidemiology in three uh, regions of, of Eastern Africa. And this, um, you know, by way of background, just broad brush strokes here, um, we know that mobility in Sub-Saharan Africa um, presents a widespread challenge to the global HIV AIDS response. So the literature is not perfect, the literature is very in incomplete, but we do know um, from existing literature that, that mobility acts to, to link geographically separate HIV epidemics. It, uh, it acts to intensify HIV transmission by enabling high-risk sexual behavior among people who were, who were linking those epidemics. And uh, the nascent research um, suggests that it disrupts HIV care engagement. But there are a lot of problems with the measurement of mobility, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. The data sources are limited, um, and um, there are problems with, with measurement and gaps, but we do know from the existing data that mobility is highly prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so international migrant, uh, migration from Sub-Saharan Africa to the global north is, is very limited, actually. It's quite small relative to other um, you know, global uh, south to north migration. But within the continent of Africa, actually the, the intercontinental immigration rate is highest in the world in Africa. So actually Africans are the most mobile people in the world when you consider um, migration from country to country and within countries or internal migration within Africa. And uh, we know that migration is more, and mobility in general, is more complex in Africa than, than elsewhere. So that kind of predominant uh, rural to urban move, move or urbanization, which is sort of the classic uh, pattern of migration, isn't necessarily predominant in all settings. And, and we have rural to rural migration. We even have counter urbanization and other more complex forms of, of mobility emergent in sub-Saharan Africa, which are the more difficult ones to measure. 
In addition, the measures themselves that have often been used are quite static. Um, while mobility is dynamic by definition, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the measures used have not, has not, have not you know, necessarily captured that dynamic nature of mobility. They've often been quite unidimensional and they've been gender biased, which has led to the under measurement of women's participation in mobility. Um, and for HIV research in particular, it's been a problem that measures of, of mobility are applied inconsistently across studies, so it gets very difficult to compare, um, com compare um, the effects of mobility on um, HIV outcomes across studies. So our study has an overall aim to measure the impact of mobility on HIV incidence and on HIV care cascade outcomes in rural Eastern African communities participating in a large HIV test and treat trial, the SEARCH trial. Um, and the ultimate aim of that work will be to inform the development of interventions designed to optimize the HIV prevention and care cascades in mobile populations. So we actually have a lot of exciting analyses underway and due to be presented um, this year. But for this paper, um, we are presenting new methods and metrics for the measurement of these complex dimensions of mobility across regions of Eastern Africa with unique HIV epidemiology. So we're, we're measuring mobility across multiple temporal and geographic scales by HIV status and by gender. So uh, the data I'm presenting today are from a population-based observational cohort study, a five-year study with this title um, and funding from NIMH that is embedded within the Sustainable East Africa Research and Community Health or SEARCH trial led by Dan Havlier and colleagues. And in our data, we are collecting data every six months from a random sample of 2,308 adults in 12 communities, that's 12 of the 32 communities in search across the three regions of search in Kenya and Uganda. And we also have an embedded couples cohort. We have a, um, a couples cohort of an additional 240 um, individuals in addition to this individual's cohort. But the data I'm presenting today are all individual level data. And we conducted individual sa uh, level sampling within community stratified by sex, by baseline HIV status and search, and by baseline residential stability and search. So the people that were mobile versus had been in their home um, at least six months of the past 10 years, um, excuse me, of the past year. So all of the analyses that I'm gonna present use survey weights with adjusted standard errors for clustering by community. So here are some pictures of some of the kinds of data that we collect every six months. We're collecting information on the forms of mobility, which are the flows um, and, and types of mobility, urban, rural, um, by locations. We're um, defining temporicity or the frequency by duration of various moves over specific time periods. We're collecting geographic information on the, the key origins and destinations, uh, transit hubs and circuits, and the characteristics of mobile populations. And we are also collecting uh, samples for uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia testing, urine samples, and uh, taking hair samples uh, to measure ARV levels in hair. And thank you, Monica Gandhi. Here's a, a map of the study communities. We have three in southwestern Uganda, three in eastern Uganda, and six in Kenya. So we had three inland communities in Kenya and three uh, lakeshore communities in Kenya so that we capture that kind of heterogeneity of, of mobility across the, the different regions involved in search. Let me start with the definition of migration, which is a change of residence over some defined geopolitical boundary. So if you, might, if you change your residence over a national um, boundary, then that's international migrant. And when you change residence within a subnational boundary, a state, a province in Uganda, say a district, um, in Kenya, a county is the, is the major geopolitical unit, um, then that would be an internal migration. And in our data, 46.7% of the people in these very rural areas, which were selected because they were rural and less mobile, yet 46.7% of the people in these communities had migrated as an adult, and that was about evenly split between men and women because women migrate for marriage. So a lot of that migration for women is, is for marriage. 
And they varied, uh, these pr proportions varied widely by region, where you had almost 70% in Western Kenya, 34.5% in Southwestern Uganda, and only 9.2% in Eastern Uganda had ever migrated as an adult. And 17.1% of people had migrated in the past five years, and 6.5% in the past one year. Um, again, that varied widely by region, with the, the highest levels in Kenya, followed by southwestern Uganda, and then much lower levels in eastern. Men, uh, most of that migration was internal migration within country, and also within um, country, either inter-district crossing over, or within district or sub-county migrations. And men were more likely than women to have migrated. For example, 20% of men and 14.9% of women had migrated in the past five years. Um, the only uh, scale of migration in which women predominated was in um, the most localized. So women were more likely than men to have migrated within district or within county. And for a definition of mobility, travel to and from a primary residence that requires sleeping away from the residence. So we're excluding commuting and we're excluding changes of residence. Um, 9% of the populations in these very rural areas had traveled for purposes of work or livelihoods in the past six months. And then again, were more women, were more likely than women um, to, to do that. 17.2% of men, 2.3% of women had traveled away from their home and slept away from their home for purposes of work. And again, that varied by, by region. Um, 43.9% had traveled for other purposes in the in the past six months. So that included reasons like care, you know, going for caregiving, going for care seeking, visiting family, holidays, attending funerals, um, schooling, those other purposes. And um, in that category of recent mobility, women predominated. 54% of women versus 31% of men had migrated, uh, excuse me, were mobile for other purposes, traveling for other purposes. And um, those proportions again showed higher mobility in Kenya, followed by southwestern Uganda than eastern Uganda. This figure shows the magnitude of mobility flows um, in between origins and destinations. Um, so it's the weighted number of overnight trips per person between the origin and destination pairs. So these are counties. And here in the yellow is Kenya, and then the green is southwestern Uganda, and in the blue is eastern Uganda. So you can see the magnitude of that, that um, mobility. And this combines mobility for work and other kinds of mobility. And you can see that most of the mobility is within the county or within a neighboring county. And you also see that there are differences by gender. And that has to do with the types of livelihood opportunities that are, that are available in certain geographic settings and that are available to women versus men. So for example, in Homa Bay County, a lot of women are engaged in the fishing industry. Homa Bay is the, the, a setting of the, the, like, the, the largest catch in the wild catch fisheries sector in Kenya is in Homa Bay County with the deepest waters. When they're traveling to, uh, to beaches, they might have several homes, they might have an inland home, and they're traveling back and forth between multiple homesteads. And for example, in Matuma in Uganda, men are, are, are traveling periodically and seasonally to engage in work on uh, tea, and, tea and coffee plantations and that sort of thing. So these things are, are really structured um, by the labor, the labor markets. And the other thing I would say is that these counties, although they're primarily rural, the ones where you have a magnitude of mobility are also counties in which um, there are major trucking corridors and linking, um, re linking roads to, to capital cities and to neighboring countries. This figure shows ecological associations of community level HIV prevalence in search and community level prevalence of different metrics of mobility in search. And basically it shows um, that community level measures of mobility, migration, and HIV prevalence tended to correlate regionally. So Kenyan communities had both the highest HIV prevalence and the greatest proportion of recent migrants and, and mobile people. Um, followed by communities in southwestern Uganda and eastern Uganda. So each of these little dots is, is a community. Whoops. Um, and, uh, yeah, communities with the higher HIV prevalence in women tend to also have the greatest proportion of, of women um, reporting um, 
non-labor related mobility in the past um, six months. And this figure shows proportions reporting mobility metrics by HIV status, uh, age band, and, and sex. And you can see in general that people who are HIV positive in red are more mobile uh, than, than people who are HIV negative in blue. And um, the differences between, for example, work-related mobility, um, oops, this is very light touch, okay. That work-related mobility for men ages 25 to 34 was particularly striking with maybe, uh, I think 40% 40, 40 of HIV positive men conduct, uh, engaging in any kind of travel for work in the past six months versus 20% of HIV negative men in that age group traveling for work. And women, um, who are HIV positive are more likely to have, um, have traveled for either work or non-work related reasons in the past six months compared to women who are HIV negative. And this figure shows our adjusted relative risks of associations between HIV status and mobility metrics by sex. So we saw that in multivariate analysis, the higher probability of work related mobility among HIV positive men and women uh, compared to HIV negative men and women held in our sex stratified model, models that adjusted for, for age and, and region. So um, here we see much higher um, relative risks. And we don't see uh, any evidence that recent migration was associated with HIV in either men or women in the adjusted models. So in summary, there were major differences in the forms of mobility and the magnitude of mobility across regions by sex and by HIV status. And overall, a greater proportion of men migrated, but a greater proportion of women uh, actually were, were mobile or traveled in the past six months relative to men, when we include both the work and the non-work related mobility in the past six months. Men and women living with HIV tended to be more mobile and to have uh, and to and more likely to have recently migrated. But the purposes of that mobility differed a lot, um, where men composed a greater proportion of those who traveled for work in these very rural areas, and women for non-labor related reasons. Communities with higher proportions of mobile residents tended to also have higher HIV prevalence, and even very recent mobility was associated with higher HIV prevalence. Some takeaway messages were that not just the conventional measures of uh, mobility, such as internal migration or uh, international migration, but also more short-term and localized forms of mobility were associated with, a, uh, with prevalent HIV infection. And so if we had used very restricted definitions of mobility, for example, defining people as census categories do uh, as internal migrants, would miss a large and disproportionately female proportion of the population who are engaged in local mobility. And um, we also see that short-term mobility, for purposes related to the livelihood opportunities available to people in these rural areas, is also highly associated with HIV infection, particularly for women. Prior, our prior qualitative research that I mentioned earlier um, had explored why that was the case. And we see, in fact, that engagement in informal sector trading and the kinds of opportunities available to women permits them opportunities for transactional sex to top up income or supplement their income, their low and very sporadic income in, these, in the context of these volatile labor markets. So it's being away from home, <laughs> away from social monitoring of your local community, and it's um, having opportunities to interact with people with whom one can engage um, in sex for money as a part of a mix of livelihoods. This is something that we um, discuss in, um, in a manuscript, that, in an article we published in Social Science and Medicine in, in 2014. And just to note, this is just our baseline data analysis. So obviously we cannot make any, uh, draw any conclusions about the direction of causality um, in those associations that I've presented today. Um, but regardless of the mechanism, higher levels of mobility among people living with HIV AIDS has major implications for the global HIV AIDS response. And it may impede the ability of current models of test and treat and other kind of population-based, community-based uh, intervention models to find, test, and treat those most at risk of sustaining local transmission. And in fact, mobility has been implicated in the null findings of several of the trials uh, to date. 
So understanding the drivers of mobility, along with knowing where people are going, when they move, and who these mobile people are, um, can enable us to identify and target the full set of solutions needed to the end of the epidemic. Now, I'm just going to leap ahead. Even though <laughs> I haven't yet presented our care cascade outcome data, I, I'm leaping ahead because I know you're going to ask about this. What is needed? What are the solutions needed? And, and we do have some um, preliminary sense of the kinds of new interventions, policies, and health systems improvements that are needed. And some of the things that I'm interested in exploring and that I would say look promising would be new models of differentiated care. Um, I think mobile people are very well positioned to take advantage of these, and they may be especially beneficial for mobile people if they can be simplified and adapted to better meet the needs of mobile people living with HIV AIDS. Um, New therapeutic technologies that permit mobile individuals to visit clinics left less often um, will be very, very helpful, including the longer acting formulations of ART and PrEP. And then taking those technologies and extending them, expanding them beyond clinic settings into the places where mobile populations are found, into those key destinations and transit hubs could be promising. And then finally, economic interventions that can reduce financial pressures and facilitate individuals' ability to, to prioritize health, all of that would also be necessary to truly facilitate the full inclusion of mobile populations in the global effort to end HIV. So let me acknowledge all of the, the team members, colleagues, mentors engaged in this study who are listed here, all of our uh, funders, um, advisors, and collaborators, and uh, thank you all as well. What might happen next? Are you, um, are, are you exploring some of those in your future projects? There is one uh, study that is, uh, we hope, um, about to be funded. Um, that we are told is about to be funded that is working with um, one of the mobile populations identified in our study, which are the fishermen in Kenya. So one, um, one intervention that we'll be testing soon is an intervention to work with social networks of fishermen and identify network central, highly socially connected men at the center of these social networks and engage them in distributing HIV self-test kits to other men, other men in their close social networks, and also promote linkage to ART or to PrEP uh, to men in their close social networks as a way to kind of in, as a way to increase uh, participation in testing and linkage to PrEP and, and uh, ART. So that's one that we're engaged in, um, and and there are more in the hopper. <laughs> And I assume that these populations are different than the ones that uh, Warren and I heard about um, when we were in Kasumu. That is that more of the an urban population compared to these? Well, the fishermen are rural. So, um, I mean, as you know, yeah. these beach areas are very, very rural. Um, and yet there's a high mobility. And as you know, yeah, yeah. It, that's where HIV incidence yeah. is not yet under control. Yeah. It's just there's this pocket in which the epidemic is not yet controlled. And it's because of all of the kind of um, gender-related structural and mobility barriers um, that are faced by the populations living in these very rural beach communities. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I have yeah. two completely unrelated questions. Um, one is uh, we were in, we were wondering time-wise, so time away from home, if mm -hmm. you measured gender differences. Um, yes. Um, let me see. I mean, we we did measure time away, and I think that we saw in the final adjusted model. In our adjusted models, the amount of time spent away from home was associated with being HIV positive in men, for men, adjusting for age and region, um, and not for women, and not interestingly. For women. Yeah. Uh, because it could be that women would go for work and then come home. Well, they do they tend to return more frequently. Right. Okay. Uh, and it's partly because of just the gender role expectations related to childbearing and uh, homesteads. Um, so they might travel more locally and more frequently. And, but men, when they travel locally and frequently, as if men behave, when men behave like women, uh, 
there doesn't seem to be any effect on their sexual risk behavior or on their um, risk of STI or, or HIV. And by the way, we have another paper that I didn't, you know, I didn't present the findings of that paper, but it was just published in JIS in January, this past January, that looks at sexual behavior and mobility and, and gender that explores some of those issues as well. Super interesting, thank you. Can I um, sure. go ahead then? Um, uh, I was wondering about the um, uh, cell phones. You talk about mobile. Yes. And are all of these people on yes. cell phones yes. everywhere? And yes. Do you see a, a strong yes. role? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it. they're very, very important. I mean, if you're going to look at any kind of, um, you know, very rural, uh, poorest of the poor, Population that's in need of intervention. I mean, at least mobile people of those of that population, those are the ones that have phones because people need it for phones. And you'd be surprised that someone may not be able to feed their children that night, but they have a phone. They might top it up with you know 50 shillings you know tomorrow, but they have a phone. Um, so we, um, I, I think that, that mobile technologies is are, are really important, and I think that. Um, there's a lot to be done to think about ways of decentralizing um, health information to take advantage of the fact that the cell phones are ubiquitous. Not necessarily smartphones, but cell phones. So, thank you. 